Hello, everyone. My name is Shauna Sylvester, and it is delightful to be here with you tonight. I want us to start my presentation by taking you back to my dinner table, and I'm 14 years old. And my father is a Canadian hist historian, and he would spend hours regaling us with facts and figures about Canadian history that he had honed over several years of teaching uh, undergraduates. And there was this one night that my brother David and I got into this very deep discussion about the coal mine strike of 1913. And this was an Nanaimo strike. And my dad said, the problem with the two of you is you've never read Harold Innes. And I said, Harold Innes? Who's Harold Innes? And my brother, who would never get caught out on one of my father's appeals to an obscure text, got up and said, Harold Innes? Oh, yeah, I've read him. He's that staple guy. And my dad said, yes, always finding the teachable moment. And he said, what did he teach us? He taught us that our political history and our economic identity is wrapped up. It's shaped by the exploitation and the exporting of our raw resources, our staples, fur, metal, fossil fuels. And then he paused for dramatic effect, as only he could do. And he said, you know, we'll never be more than the hewers of wood and the drawers of water supplying advanced industrial countries if we can't see beyond just being a resource economy. Well, I learned more about Harold Innes over the years, but as our Canadian manufacturing sector took on growth and we became much more of a service-based, knowledge-based economy, Innes kind of was relegated to the history books where he belonged. Because after all, he described an old economy, an old traditional economy. And we were much more confident. We were active on the international arena. We'd moved beyond that. Until maybe last year, Harold Innes came up for me in a pretty big way during the last provincial election. That's when Premier Christy Clark announced that we are going to adopt liquid natural gas. Now, it wasn't the, the, the adoption of LNG, that announcement, that that was such a surprise. LNG is not new. It's not innovative. Many countries have got it. It was that what happened in that month is the whole narrative of our BC economy shifted. We shifted from being this service-centered, knowledge-based economy, a global leader in climate change, and we shifted to be talking about ourselves as a resource-based economy again. This became really clear to me last week when I was in, in Brussels at the European Union facilitating uh, discussions on renewable energy. And it was fascinating to hear the discussions in Europe because they weren't shaped on how are we going to meet the hungry energy demands of Asia with shale gas. The conversations there were all about how do we get to renewables, 100% renewables if that was ever possible. And it wasn't climate change that was the imperative for this shift. It was economic opportunity. It was job creation, innovation, lower energy costs energy security. And I listened to the Europeans present, and they really do like to present, the more the better. I came away and I started to think about our energy here in BC in three different ways. And the first way I would call the staple after Harold Innes. And it's characterized by oil, natural gas, um, LNG, and it is commodity-centered and export-oriented. It requires large investments, large infrastructure, and it promises high returns, but for very high environmental costs. The second is the grid. This is the electrical side of things. Big hydro generally connects also run of the river, coal-fired electricity, perhaps some wind. It's centralized. It's highly regulated. And like a mainframe computer or a telephone line, the cost of the infrastructure can be quite high, and the cost to distribute and transport that energy is borne in our utility rates. The third, I'll call the network. So if the grid is the telephone lines and the mainframe computer, the network is more our smartphones. It's the personal computers. It's the decentralized model of energy Distribution, it's about district energy nodes where energy is produced by local communities or by the consumers. And energy is seen much less as a commodity as much as it's seen as a process. And it depends on many different kinds of technology. 
So those three, I actually think we have all three in BC. But as I started to think about our, our future and our new narrative, I wondered how much longer could we hold on to that mix in BC? As we start accelerating the development to LNG, what are we losing? Well, let's look at some of the questions around LNG. Is, Japan, is the price going to hold? Is Japan and China going to want our LNG when it's not at market and there's so many others that are? China's number one priority in their latest five-year plan is energy sufficiency. They are the largest investors in renewables. They're just going to keep investing in renewables. Will they choose to increase their dependence on fossil fuel? It's a question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the business case for LNG. And in terms of LNG, we're going to have to create Site C. We're going to need to build out our distribution system. We're going to have to fortify that grid a great deal more to power those LNG facilities. How is that going to be paid for? Are we going to start seeing in our electricity bills the distribution and the cost of the grid? And then from a climate change, let's look at our GHG profile. Let there be no mistake that as we invest in LNG, even if it's the cleanest LNG in the world, that we are going to meet our climate targets. It's a move in the opposite direction. So when I look at what we're losing, I also look at what the clean tech sector has brought. This is a sector that has been growing very fast. 2.5 billion in 2011 to our economy, 57% jump from where it was in 2008. A major job creator, major innovation. It's providing us with a globally competitive knowledge-based industry. But that's not where we're putting our energy. That's not where we're putting our focus. Instead, we're going back to what we know well, how to be a hewer of wood and a drawer of water. It's like Walt Patterson says, we're embracing the fire age when the future is in the digital age. So I'm thinking it might be time to invite our premier over for a Sunday night dinner. I'm thinking that perhaps my father could share some of the lessons and the wisdom of Harold Innes and say that we can be more than a staple economy. We can be leaders in global energy and clean energy. We have the brains, we have the technology, we have the understanding. It's just that we have to have the political will and we have to see the economic opportunity and have the confidence to compete globally. Thank you.